Welcome to the Be Bold Podcast. I'm Beth Whitman. Hey, before I get to today's guest, who I am so excited about, I just want to do a quick check-in and let you know what I am working on right now. I'm busy actually preparing for a number of things. First, I am headed down to the San Francisco area in a couple of weeks to record with some pretty awesome women down there. I haven't let you in on uh, who these women are, but I will soon be sharing their names with my Patreon supporters, and I will allow them to submit questions that I can then relay to these women who will be future guests. And that's just one of the perks of being a Patreon supporter. I know you've heard me talk about Patreon before, but I just want to reiterate here what it is. Patreon is a platform where you can support me and the podcast, and it's just for a small amount each month. Now, the first 10 patrons at five bucks a month received a Be Bold bracelet as a special thank you. And now I've opened up the patron options to include a tip jar at just a buck a month. Basically, what I'm saying is this. If you find value in these conversations and you can afford as little as a dollar a month, I will love you so much. (laughs) And if you think that one dollar doesn't make a difference or if you're embarrassed about only giving that much, let me tell you this. It all adds up and it's truly appreciated. And I really mean that. Now, the $5 level gets you all sorts of added benefits, including access to special audio and written content. I'll also add you to a private Facebook group, and you'll have the ability to know who guests are, you know, in advance and to submit questions to them. And I've got some other things in the works as well, and I'll announce those as they come to fruition. For more details, go to she'sboldpodcast.com slash Patreon. I'll link to that in the show notes for easy access. Okay, what else am I up to? I am headed to India in just a few weeks, and I cannot believe that trip is literally around the corner. I'm spending a week in the state of Gujarat, that's west of Rajasthan, and I'll be doing research for a future trip there that will feature textiles, tribes, and music, and I'm pretty excited about that. It'll be my first time to to that area. Now, after that, I'm meeting up with my tour group, And I'm escorting these lovely ladies from Chennai, where we'll be meeting, and I'll be escorting them down south through Pondicherry, the tea plantations of Munar, and on to Kerala. And that trip, I got to tell you, is going to be so much fun. Now, I've got other trips I'm planning, but the other thing that is most immediately on my mind is a spring trip to Morocco. I have a bunch of ladies who've already contacted me about that future women-only trip. And if you have any interest in joining me on a Morocco or even the India trip, let me know and I'll put you on a list to be notified when those are available for registration. Best email is beth at she'sboldpodcast.com. One last note, if you want information on anything, if you have a burning question for me, or you just want to be featured on the She's Bold podcast in some way, you can call and leave a message at 877-280-5170. Also, on the She's Bold podcast.com website, there is a submission form in the upper right corner. If you or someone you know you think might be a good guest, just fill in that submission form, and I would love to check that out. Now, if you do leave a question on that phone line, I may just feature you and my answer to that question on a future episode. That phone number, as well as the link to the Patreon page, will also be in the show notes. Okay, today's guest. I am so excited to bring you today's conversation with Gerilyn Brousseau. Gerilyn and I go back a long time with some really interesting connections that literally go back decades. Gerilyn has led and continues to lead two very different lives that have both allowed her to pursue passions that have supported her over the years. And I think it's fair to say she loves them both equally. Some of you may know Gerilyn as the founder of Peace Trees Vietnam, an organization dedicated to clearing landmines. And they've cleared more than 110,000 so far. And this is from a heavily bombed region of Vietnam. Others may know Gerilyn as the Cinemom, 
the woman behind the irresistible recipe that we know as Cinnabon. Now, my connection with Gerilyn goes back more than 20 years, and it dates back to a pretty amazing connection with Vietnam. In this conversation, we talk in depth about her work in the Southeast Asian country that was so devastated by the war. And her work started many years ago when she and her late husband, Dana Perry, got this crazy idea to bring the people of Vietnam and the people of the U.S. together to build these bridges. She continues this work and her travels there to this day. She actually had just returned the week prior to us recording this. She was just there. But we also talk about her work in the culinary world and how she went from owning a restaurant in the Seattle area to becoming the creator of what is arguably the world's best known cinnamon roll. And I say world's best known because I looked it up. You can find Cinnabon in 48 countries. No matter how you know her or whether you know her at all, I know you'll love this conversation with the amazing and inspirational Gerilyn Brousseau. So you actually just started by asking me a question. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? Hi, Ben. <laughs> Hi, Gerilyn. <laughs> did you ever know my late husband, Dan and Perry? I did. Yeah. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. I'd you know, it's, it. it's, I mean, that was a tough time for you, right? That was 21, two years ago, about two. Yeah. So right through Peace Trees. So because I was on the Sister City organization with Vietnam, there was, I can't recall all the details, um, but there was a connection there with Peace Trees. Mm -hmm. And I knew of the work that you and Danan were doing. And I remember hearing the news about when he passed away. And, you know, my, my ties, and, and this will come out throughout our conversation, but my ties to Vietnam have been so strong and so so strangely strong for a foreigner, you know, to have such a, to, to feel so such a pull with the country that when he passed away, it really affected me in some weird way because I didn't know him well. I only knew of his work. I didn't know you well. I know I knew of your work with Peace Trees, but I went to his service, his celebration, and boy, I should have such a send off. You know, hundreds, hundreds of people in this church in North Seattle. Boy, I remember it so vividly. It's so crazy. And music and singing and clapping and crying and dancing. It was a party. It was so special because I don't think I'd ever been to a memorial service for someone before where it was a true celebration. It was such a celebration. And you were so poised and you were so beautiful and so lovely and and, I, and that just affected me so much, just that grace and that poise, the way you held yourself. And so, I'll, yeah, so I always felt a connection because of that. So, yeah, I, I, I knew Dana not well, but he, his life and his passing affected me a lot to, you know, to the extent that I remember it so vividly so many years later. Wow. I'm so touched to hear this. I didn't know that you knew him. I didn't know you were at his service. There were about 800 people 800. There. Oh, my goodness. And, you know, there were pastors, rabbis, people of every possible religious and, you know, spiritual persuasion that led that big, a big ceremonial entrance into the church. Yeah. I remember Af African dancers. African dancers. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you for telling me. This is incredible. Thank you for asking. Well, it's it's another way that we're connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's um, yeah, very strong memory for me. So, you know, like I said, thank you know, thank you for being such a graceful, beautiful human being. For that to have been such a lasting memory for me of you, you know, just um, yeah. Hmm. So. <laughs> I'm very touched. Yeah. Thank well, you. I'm just so glad you asked that question because you didn't, you didn't realize. So yeah. So, um, so yeah. So it was not my intention to start at that, <laughs> at that point, but you asked the question. I thought, okay, God, let's just hit record and let's just start right there. So for listeners, let's talk about peace trees. Let's just drop right in there. And if you would describe peace trees and the work that you do and that you've done in the past and how long that is and kind of the genesis for that. 
Okay, I will. <laughs> it's a family story. You know, Peace Trees Vietnam is a family story, one which I could not have actually envisioned, yet knew that one day something would come. And it really began on the day that I heard the news that my brother had just been shot down and killed in Vietnam. He was a U.S. Army helicopter pilot who left Seattle. He had trained at Fort Ord and several other bases around the country to become a helicopter pilot. And he left Seattle on December 19th of 1968. He and his fiance had just been engaged three days before. And on the 6th of January, we heard the tragic news that my brother and his co-pilot had been shot down and killed in Vietnam. Less than a month later. Correct. Saving the life of another pilot, a pilot, a fellow pilot who had been shot down just ahead of them. And they went in to provide ground support so that that first pilot could be evacuated safely, and they were killed in so doing. And that moment was, it was the most incomprehensible news I had ever heard. I was uh, 26, and my brother was uh, just about to turn 22. There were four years between us. I was keenly aware in that moment, this all occurred in a moment as I was standing at my back door hearing the news. To imagine a loss so great in such a short period of time, and all I could think of were my parents, that everything my parents had done to groom my brother Daniel Cheney to be a responsible, engaged citizen and a great leader. He was so full of energy and vitality and charm and really smart. And when he was growing up, he was just a total character and got into everything. So my parents just poured their heart and soul and love and discipline and every possible way to train him and give him guideposts to grow and become the really incredible person that he was. And to imagine, you know, like in this fast, like the blink of an eye, literally, all of that was gone. And my parents, like my loss was great. My parents' loss was tremendous. And I suddenly realized that my parents were joining thousands and thousands and thousands of American families losing sons, brothers, dads, cousins, nephews, and, and of course, some daughters too. Women were killed in Vietnam as well. And in this moment, kind of like the, left, the whole left side of my horizon was filled with American families who were losing their family members. And in that moment, this amazing thought came to me, but wait, 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 there's thousands of Vietnamese families losing their kids brothers, dads, uncles. And suddenly this whole horizon was to my left filled with American families and Vietnamese families. And the sense I had was of a hand reaching out. And the words that came to me were, somehow, someday, ordinary American families like my family must reach out to the Vietnamese people to go underneath the pain of this war and begin to build bridges of trust and understanding. I didn't know how. I only knew that that must happen at some point. And I didn't ever discuss that with anyone, ever in my life, or share it. And the day came exactly 26 years later. On July 11th of 1995, the day the U.S. and Vietnam established diplomatic relations for the first time. My husband, Danan, and I were on a plane. We were leaving Berlin, Germany. We had just co-facilitated a conference on healing the wounds of war of World War II, and people from all possible sides of World War II had come together. It was the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II, and it was the dream of a Dutch grandfather that he could one day make peace with the German people before he died. So the Dutch were there, the Germans were there, Japanese were there, a Dutch man who'd been a prisoner of war as a young boy in Indonesia, 
during World War II. People came from Africa. They came from all over the world to tell their stories and really continue the healing from World War II. Profoundly moving experience. And as we went out to the airport and got on the plane, the flight attendant came down the aisle with newspapers and she offered the Herald Tribune. And I saw the headlines and my eyes, I mean, I was just astonished. Headlines, big headlines. U.S. normalizes with Vietnam. (laughs) And Dana was sitting next to me and I kind of nudged him and said, it's time to go. Mm. Had you talked about it with him before that? We had. So this is, so you had had this idea at 26 that was bubbling underneath Mm -hmm. that hadn't, you hadn't really talked about. And then with the work that you were doing. With with Peace Tree, with Dana's program, Peace Trees, of bringing young people together all over the world who'd grown up in conflicts and bringing kids from all the sides of conflicts together somewhere in the world to plant trees together. In fact, the first ever Peace Trees program was at Oroville. Mm, in, in South India. 1988. Yeah, where mm-hmm. I'm going shortly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can tell you about the trees. <laughs> oh, I bet. Now I will go and appreciate the trees with yes. new appreciation. Yes. I'll go, I'll go yes. see them with new appreciation. So the idea was to create Peace Trees Vietnam because the Peace Trees then had been in 18 places around the world. And they then said, okay, I'm in. I'll do it. However, I'm going to raise you one. And anytime he said that, I would just think, (laughs) oh, I'd better straighten my spine and breathe deeply because something big is coming. And he said, okay, Peace Trees Vietnam will address the legacy of unexploded landmines and bombs left from the war. And I had this shiver. Oh, my gosh. Okay, we'll do it. He was a, you probably know this, he was a recovering nuclear physicist Mm -hmm. turned peacemaker. So he knew he had great, vast knowledge about landmines and was very concerned about the landmine dilemma around the world. And so this was the opening And by the time the plane landed back and we were back in Seattle, we had a plan Mm -hmm. that we would create together a small core of Seattle citizens who would come, we would sit down together with them and we would propose our idea that we would reach out to the Vietnamese people as American citizens, as a family, to propose building bridges of trust and understanding to honor the losses on all the sides of the war. There were many. Through sponsoring the clearance of landmines and unexploded ordnance in the most war-torn areas of the country. Mm. That was in July. Of 95. Of 1995. In November, we we had gathered our friends on November 11th, 1995. We sat down together with our most stick your neck out global visionary friends, Kay Bullitt, you probably know most mm-hmm. of these people, Roy Farrell, who was the president of Physicians for Social Responsibility and Physicians Against uh, Nuclear War, and Stadler, who was with King Broadcasting, who developed community bridge-building programs and documentaries between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, Fred Noland, who was a returned plowshare, returned Peace Corps volunteer working with plowshares in the Seattle Tashkent Sister City program here. So all people who are working deeply with the Soviet Union, because that's how Dana and I met, was working in the Soviet Union in the 80s. And they all said, we proposed our ideas and laid it all out. And they said, we're in. We support you. And they also had a strong connection to Governor Lowry, who was also willing to be of support. He had just taken uh, the first governor's trip to Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yeah, he was very this. progressive. Yeah, in, sure. In September in of, of 1995. That. Mm-hmm. So that was November 11th, 1995. On Sunday and that night, Danan took a red-eye flight to Washington, D.C. There was an unannounced but open reception at what was then the consulate of Vietnam. They did not yet have an embassy. And the Chargé d'Affaires was Levon Bang, who became later the first ambassador to Vietnam. Dana arrived at the, at the address at, on 11th Avenue and stepped off the elevator. And there, standing at the elevator, was this lovely, very gracious gentleman and introduced himself as Levon Bang. 
and said, welcome, please come in. What can we do for you? And Damon said, I apologize, Your Excellency, I have arrived without an invitation. (laughs) I have an important matter to discuss, a, a proposal of a way that Americans and Vietnamese could work together to begin building bridges of trust and understanding. And he said, please come in, come in, come in. So they went in and sat down, and Dana shared the idea with him. And when they finished, he said, I will do everything to help you. So when we landed in Vietnam on January 6th, 1996, it was the 27th anniversary of the day my brother was shot down. Was that the first time you had been there? Yes. Oh, yeah. Ever. Yeah, ever. I think someone was watching over us that we landed on the 27th anniversary. And very shortly thereafter, like within 24 hours, we in, we were invited to visit and meet with leaders of the country. Mm-hmm. Was that all in Hanoi? Only in Hanoi. So we were, we were welcomed by Mr. Vu Zuan Hom, who was the president of the Vietnam Union of Friendship Organizations. You probably know them. Yeah, I don't recall. If and I he welcomed us in with this big smile, which I could hardly, you know, in a certain way, believe my eyes. Who would have known there would be this friendly, warm greeting on the other side of the world during mm-hmm. those painful and difficult years of the war? And he said, please come in, come in, come in. And we sat down and he said, you know, he leaned forward and the tea was on the table. And he leaned forward and he said, you know, it's time to close the past and open the future. Mm. We've been waiting for the American people for a very long time. And we began to share our idea that as Americans, we would propose working together to begin building bridges of trust and understanding to honor losses to all families on all sides through the vehicle of clearing landmines and bombs in the most war-torn area. And Mr. Holm welcomed us so warmly and said, I will invite you to Quang Tri Province. And we took the night train. took 15 hours. Mm -hmm. You'll remember this. Yeah, I do. I I know that train. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We took the night train 15 hours to Quang Tri. And in the morning when we arrived there, what stands out for me is the almost incomprehensive landscape I could I'd ever seen. I couldn't I couldn't have imagined seeing bomb crater after bomb crater after bomb crater on the horizon. And the train pulled into Dong Ha and one of the representatives from the Dep- the Quang Tri Province Department of Foreign Affairs came to greet us and again, big smile. Warm welcome, took us to his office. I mean, here we were in this town that was, it felt like the war ended yesterday. And the province was like the craters of the moon. You probably saw it. In yeah, those, in yeah, those days. yeah, yeah. The thing is, you described this, and, and I experienced this myself with my first trip to Vietnam in 1992, that they were so eager to put everything behind them and just move forward. Yes. I mean, and there's some good reason for that because they, because we have more than they have or had and and they needed our help but they were just they were so warm and open and inviting and excited so excited to have the help of Americans and for us we have so much baggage that we land in Vietnam and Vietnam in particular but I'm sure there's other countries around Afghanistan you know today might be Afghanistan we have so much baggage that it's hard to fathom their open arms, how open they were and are. And and I think that for me was the biggest thing for me to grapple with and kind of shake my head at the first, you know, first couple of times or few times that I went to Vietnam in the early to mid nineties of how could they be so open when we've got so much dang baggage (laughs) that we're carrying around with us. But that's exactly what you're describing is just this openness of, yes, of um, please come, we welcome, yes. we welcome the help. Yes. And the phrase that always has stuck with me since that day is, it's time to close the past and open the future. Mm-hmm. And still today, 23 years later, we are working in the same province with the exact same people we started with 
Are you still clearing landmines there? Every day. Why? Why are there still landmines? It was a bitter war. Wow, that's a long time. Quang Tri Province has the distinction, sad distinction of being considered by many historians as the most severely bombed landscape in the history of the world. In the world. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea how much more there is to do there in terms of years? There are different perspectives. I'll tell you some of the statistics about Quang Tri. It's about the size of King County near where, in where we live in Washington state. And more ordinance was expended in that province than all the combined allied forces of World War II. So that, that translates to, for the population of Quang Tri province, of Vietnamese people of the province, approximately 6.6 tons of ordinance per person. There were, before the war, 1,100 villages in the province. There were three when the war ended. And at that time, in 1996, when we arrived, at least every week, one person was suffering an accident and losing their life or being severely injured by landmines and bombs. And up until that point, about 10,000 people had been injured or killed in Quang Tri since the end of the war. When I was there visiting you in uh, in 99, I remember, do you remember the little boy who pulled up his shirt? John. I have that I have that photo of you him. Do? I have yeah, I've got it, this photo of him. He pulled up his shirt and this terrible scar. Yeah, it was just that awful. Was yeah. yeah, and yeah. he and his brother had yes. um, had found a an unexploded ordinance yes. and picked it up and it exploded yes. in his stomach. Thank goodness he lived. Yes, he lived. His little brother didn't. We met Zhang on our first day there in Quang Tri when they welcomed us. They took us out to show us different possible sites for our first clearance together and then took us to visit Zhang. And he was six at that time. He had been in this, this accident had happened in the last, in the, sometime in the last two or three months before we were there. And he was this very sad little boy sitting on a kind of stool by the side of the road outside his house as we pulled up. And it was just so tragic. This little bundle of a little boy hunched over and his he'd lost his left hand when that explosive detonated. They found it in the garden outside their home. He lost his left hand and his left eye, and and his abdomen was severely wounded, as you mentioned. And his little brother, who was three, was killed in the incident. So he had a very, very tragic beginning to his life. And I'm very happy to tell you that thanks to our wonderful donors to Peace Trees and our staff on the ground there, he has grown so healthy and strong and had a great education and is a welder. He's a trained welder, and he can now weld using the his the left the part of his left arm that he has and he's he's participated in the um Southeast Asia uh special olympics and he's doing great so you know they have such a positive spirit going forward i mean they just they're they're undaunted the vietnamese are undaunted by surviving in the midst of situa- a situation that is well for us as westerners it's it's horrifying to imagine living every day where an accident could happen right outside our homes. But now the demining is highly organized from the pro- by the province, by the national government, and our U.S. Department of State is phenomenal in funding and our U.S. Embassy and Ambassador in Hanoi that Peace Trees now has 70 highly trained, the most highly trained deminers in Vietnam, our Vietnamese demining teams, and that includes our medical team as well. And we've just received funding for two additional teams. And we work in the most mountainous areas, Dak Rong and Hung Hoa, so up, up Route 9, up toward Khe San and toward the Lao border. Mm. Uh, so further north or further west? west. west. Okay. And the Mines Advisory Group from, the, from Great Britain is there. Norwegian People's Aid is there, funding um, a Vietnamese NGO called Project Renew. So we have incredibly impeccable 
record keeping, data gathering. It's very organized and there is now a big push to in the next between seven to eight years to clearing the most dangerous areas of cluster munitions. Those are the most dangerous um, munitions because they were dropped from airplanes. They're about the size of a tennis ball and they were wired to land on the ground, take three turns and explode. And they have a death zone of about 15 meters, was about 45 feet. And hundreds of thousands of them in the countryside. So that poses the most severe threat because they are some of the most dangerous ordnance. Do you have statistics on how many explosives you've recovered? Yes, more than 110,000. Wow. So we know for sure that's at least 110,000 lives. Mm -hmm. But it's actually more because we clear everything from small bombies, those cluster munitions, up to 2,000-pound bombs, 500-pound bombs, 1,000-pound bombs that could blow up a town. Mm -hmm. You know, incredible. Where else is Peace Trees doing work? Is it is it concentrated? In it's it's con- concentrated we in are Vietnam concentrated now. In okay, Vietnam. so in the country. work so the the work that Danan was doing early on that is no longer with young people in conflict resolution. I think it's being carried out by many other people in many okay. countries, but the Peace Trees program, uh, Peace Trees Vietnam, is became a separate organization. Okay, after Danan passed away, and it was clear that the mission was humanitarian demining and rebuilding communities I see. and lives mm-hmm. in central Vietnam. Mm-hmm. And where do you get your funding from? From donors like you, <laughs> from incredible numbers of donors and generous donors, many veterans. Mm-hmm. And you're writing grants as grants. well. Grants. And the U.S. Department of State is, is we are very grateful to the State Department for our demining team funding. And then we take citizen diplomacy delegations to Vietnam. In the beginning, it was one a year, then it was two. Now we take between five and six delegations each year. Of how many people each? Between probably 12 and 16 people per trip. When's your next one? In August. I just came back on Sunday Mm -hmm. from a very special journey. I'm not sure I told you what what it was for, but it was focused on my brother's fiance at the time he was killed. All these years has been very close to Peace Trees Vietnam. And your brother's name is Dan, is that Daniel. Right? Yeah. yeah, my brother Dan, mm-hmm. yes. My brother Dan's fiance, Gail, who lives now in Dallas, Texas, decided one year ago that she was ready to go to Vietnam. And her wish was to be in Vietnam on the 50th anniversary of the day Dan was shot down. Dan and his co-pilot, Walter Kozlowski. And she wanted to be at the exact site So we worked for one year on this itinerary to take Gail, her closest friend since she was four years old, her brother and his partner, and two helicopter pilots to Vietnam for a very in-depth experience of the Vietnamese people and the culture and of Peace Tree's work and for her to have the opportunity to honor honor the great loss and the great gift of service that both Dan and Walter gave. And where was that? They were killed in um, Long An province, northwest of Saigon, near what was called the Parrot's Beak, Mm -hmm. near the Cambodian border. Mm -hmm. Visualizing it. And I would like to tell you one of the key points of that trip, that was our 69th citizen diplomacy delegation to (laughs) Vietnam. (laughs) One of the most Moving, touching experiences occurred on our second day in Hanoi when the Vietnam Union of Friendship Organizations and the Vietnam USA Society invited us to a special meeting to meet with Vietnamese families who had lost their family's pilot in the war. So there were three families who had lost, whose pilot was shot down. One of them was the wife and daughter who came. Another was a daughter, and the third was a daughter. And there were three pilots who survived, Vietnamese pilots who survived. Boy, talk about building bridges. It was. We were together for almost six hours. And the storytelling across the table of looking into each other's eyes and sharing the stories of the losses 
and the experience of that and the difficulty of the war, the great difficulty between you know, the historic, as the Vietnamese say, the U.S. and Vietnam have shared a difficult history. So speaking about that difficult history, both at the family level and at the national level, the Vietnamese speaking, the American speaking, created an incredible, like, bowl, a container that became the open door to building relationships. And that was just on this most recent that was trip, right? two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, on a Saturday, <laughs> two weeks ago. And once we finished, we, you know, we were at a point where we could now move to the next step. We were all invited to, to lunch at a beautiful restaurant in our own private room. And all of those talks turned into a love fest. <laughs> and smiles and the women, Gail, my Dan's fiance, and the Vietnamese women were sharing stories and having toasts with a glass of wine and loving each other and realizing that what really had happened is that they had met underneath the pain where they're very connected. Their pain was the same. And my mother had discovered that in, an, in her late 80s and 90s. She had discovered one day when she was writing thank you notes to Peace Trees donors, she realized one day that the Vietnamese mothers on the other side were sharing the same experience as she was. And that's how she knew it was time for her to go to Vietnam when she was 90. When she was To 90. go and meet the Vietnamese grandmothers mm. who had lost, you know, their, she met her counterpart who was 92, mm. who had lost her two sons in the village. She said, when the war passed by our village. So this, the possibility, here we are 50 years later, it's possible. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like that day changed my life. That it gave me a sense of... The one with your mom? I feel like two weeks ago. Oh, two weeks ago, yeah. There There's are many so many. life-changing I know, experiences. I know, I have to clarify. that day, to hear the wives and daughters of Vietnamese pilots share their experiences, and Dan's fiance Gail and my own experiences, and then the pilots all speaking, and our pilots mm. speaking... There's now a woven tapestry of friendship like this that will never be shaken Mm -hmm. of the people around that table. Mm. It really gives me hope, Yeah, you know, for today and for the future. Mm. That sometimes it just takes time. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, uh, and and I I don't mean to sidetrack or sideline the conversation, but I think it's it's an important topic to mention that you know, in the the time that we're in right now, where we're so divisive in our own country. Yes. And people are taking things very seriously. And not that they shouldn't be, but I think that it can often be like conceived that this is a time that isn't going to change. We have to work really hard to, to make a change. And sometimes things just change. Sometimes it it just takes time and to get too mired in it or too depressed over it or too angry over it, it's not going to do any good. It's not fruitful, but to give it time. And as they say, this too shall pass. Hopefully over time, (laughs) it will pass and there will be healing in this own country. Yes. Hopefully it won't take 50 years. But I just think, hopefully, yeah. yes. But I, but I do think it's, a, I think it's an important concept to think that things change, things come together. There can be a weaving once again, you know, that'll happen within our own country to bring us back together, and we have to have that hope. We do. It's required that we ha- we have positivity. Mm-hmm. It will come out of our vision and our tenacity to never, ever, ever give up. Really, to be there. Hopefully it will come soon. I wanted to tell you a little bit about just some of the background about peace trees, why the fiber is so deep in Vietnam, of working in one province for 23 years 
with our same partners. Now we work in the villages. We have microcredit programs with the women through the Women's Union, Growing Black Pepper, and now Costco is a part of that whole program wow. of supporting training of ethnic minority women in growing black pepper that can become that can come with fair trade practices and fair wages and building the community spirit and stability and income generation and nutrition for families for women to have an income to feed their families. Is there someone who's overseeing that? Oh, yes. We have a whole staff in Vietnam. We have a country director. We have an incredible staff in Vietnam. As part of Peace Trees? Oh, yes. And the Women's Union. Actually doing the work with Costco to make sure that this is a sustainable practice. We do that with the Women's Union in Quang Tri and with our our, um, country director, a lovely woman named Ha, and our Seattle executive director, who is Claire. They are brilliant leaders, bringing so much life and vitality to our work on the ground. So the work of microcredit, we've built about 15 kindergartens in the remote villages of Dakarang and Hunghua, so that ethnic minority children who do not speak Vietnamese will learn Vietnamese to prepare them to actually go to school. Are they Hmong or are they, do you know what? Uh, they do. They're what? Van Q Van Q and Paco, oh. the two tribes in Quang Tri. So it's an amazing tapestry now of activity of demining, clearing land for farmers to grow, to build schools for safety, and then clearing this amazing farmland for black pepper to grow up in the, up in the mountainous areas and the women being able to being able to generate their own income, it's, it's an amazing miracle. Mm-hmm. And this is the area where our demining teams all work. And there's also a now a communication system that's very much like at the airport, if you see something, say something, mm-hmm. to alert citizens, children, moms, dads, everyone, if you see something, ask for help, like not to pick up ordinance. So this year... 2018 and 2017 were the first two years without an accident from a landminer bomb in Quang Tri province. Th- this must have, um, <clears throat> you weren't doing this 23 years ago. Has this just been an, an evolving, slow process as you learn to work with the women's union? And then you learn that there might be an opportunity to grow black pepper. And then you learn yes. that educating the young people and the older people yes, um, how to you know, report something that they see. So it's just constantly developing because this is so much more developed and in-depth and detailed than many years ago. Yes. And the schools, so many schools. And Yeah, and the schools. Incredible schools. And as part of the kindergarten program, when a family or a person decides they would like to build a school and, and we work with the women's union and our team, our on the ground team, we have a oh in the headquarters. Do you remember our Landmines Education Center? Oh, when yes, you came I do. There? I do. That is now all the upper levels are training for our deminers and um, and for the community to come there. And and now it's all our office on the ground floor is all, we have fantastic offices now for our team. And so yes, they they work with all of these programs. So in the kindergarten, for example, the children have a meal every day that is funded by the donors who built that school because those children are extremely poor and that might be, you know, they they may not have many other meals that day. So the schools, the libraries, we have 10 libraries now for the Women's Union. The Black Pepper microcredit programs are quite fantastic. It's amazing how, how the work has grown in these years and all the thousands and thousands of trees that have been planted in <laughs> We'll have to talk afterwards because uh, I'm already thinking, I can't wait to get back there. I want to bring a group of women there. <laughs> like, yes. talk about. Mm-hmm. We'll have to talk about me putting together some sort of a tour that makes sense. That'd be great. Because I want to go back now. You know, I, 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 before we started recording, I, I brought this up. The first time I went to Vietnam was in 1992, and there was no one there then. It was actually illegal for Americans to travel to Vietnam in the early 90s. How did you go? I flew in from Bangkok. 
I got a visa in Bangkok and I flew in from there. And there were only seven cities or villages that we could visit. And they were all on a piece of paper. We weren't, we didn't have our passport stamped. We weren't allowed to have the passport stamped because then that would have given us issue when we came back to the U.S. if we had a Vietnam stamp in our passport. So we had a separate piece of paper and we were very closely watched. So <laughs> our movements <laughs> were very closely. I'm sure you were. <laughs> yeah, very closely watched. So when we were talking before we started recording, I mentioned to you that my first visit there was in 1992. And back then there was no one. <laughs> there were very few travelers there because it was actually illegal to travel to Vietnam if you were a U.S. citizen. So they didn't even stamp our passport. They gave us a separate piece of paper. And there might have been a dozen of us in the country, a dozen travelers, and they limited exactly where we could go. There, I think there were seven villages or cities where we could travel to. But from the moment that I landed, I felt like I was at home, which was the strangest feeling. Because back then, I'm 5'2 and blonde. Back then, I was one of the tallest people in <laughs> Vietnam, right? Just mm -hmm. because their stature, their health, you know, they were, they were small people. They, they are to a certain degree still, but now they're much taller, much healthier. And it, it's just the strangest thing. I can go back to Vietnam and I just feel like I'm home. And I joke that it's a past life thing. It probably is a past life thing. I mean, really, because that's the only way I can explain feeling so comfortable in a country that is so foreign to me. Do you feel like that? Totally. Vietnam is really my second home. When I usually start, fly into Hanoi, when the plane lands in Hanoi, you know, when the wheels touch, I think, oh, I'm so glad to be back. It's just like everything melts away and I'm in the culture I want to be in. I'm in a place where... I feel so at ease and always learning. How is that? It's an always learning experience, which I love. Don't you find that strange? Or do you just find that? You're For the first few it. years I did, I, I wonder why I'm so drawn. I mean, of course I was drawn to Vietnam for the reasons I mentioned earlier with regard to my brother Dan, you know, giving his life there. Yet there's something, else, there's more, it's deeper I will share with you something that one of our colleagues, one of our partners in Hanoi said to me as we were preparing for this journey that we just returned from. He said, maybe Dan gave his life here and stayed here so that we could all become brothers and sisters. That was profoundly moving to me that one of our Vietnamese partners whom I we've worked with for 23 years said that to me and I thought about I thought about the spiritual depth of the Vietnamese people which I hold in the highest regard do you consider yourself a spiritual person yes do you have a practice life my life practicing I listen I'm part of Grace Church. It's a lovely, wonderful, very progressive Episcopal church here on Bainbridge. We actually built a kindergarten in Vietnam <laughs> <laughs> for Grace Church. I was just at Thich Nhat Hanh's home monastery. home In, in France? In, in Hue. Oh, in Hue. Oh, my goodness. Where he started. No kidding. Is there still uh, is there still activity there? Oh like, are yes. There a, oh, oh yes. Really? Oh yes. We were just there. Yes. I'll so look it up they for do... you. It's, and okay. I'll give you the name. Um, it's on the outskirts of Way. It's a very old pagoda and and temple. And the monks wear those brilliant gold saffron color robes. That's where he started mm -hmm. his uh, education at sixteen. Wow. And he's planning to come back there for his final days. And and for listeners, he's now, he has a um, place in France called Plum Village, where he does a lot of teaching. It was so wonderful to be there. Oh, I bet. But the depth is what is so moving to me about the Vietnamese people and the love, which is profound, the connection with the people, the gratitude, I mean, just for the opportunity 
to work together into a new future. That is really a gift. Mm -hmm. And that we can all look into each other's eyes. And and, uh, I know this is true for you too, because you have a sense of home there. And they see your authenticity. And that's what allows the relationship Mm -hmm. to begin. When Dana died uh, suddenly in 1996, he had spent several months in Vietnam with the demining team, the first demining team clearing the Vietnamese deminers, but he had taken American veterans of Vietnam who were explosive ordnance disposal technicians. So he had spent several months there. And when he died in November of 1996, they were they were devastated. In the first 24... Was, you were both on your way... We were on our way to Vietnam. To Vietnam mm-hmm. when that happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He died actually walking onto the ferry here. Mm-hmm. I was on the ferry already and he died in the walkway. In the first 24 hours after he passed away, I received two cables from Vietnam from the leaders in Hanoi. And one f- and, and a telegram from the embassy in Washington, D.C. Mm. They loved him. And... I've always wondered about the depth of friendship they created with him and and treasured that memory. And I was thinking about this yesterday because one day one of our partners said to me, this was recently, we didn't know when Dana died if you would be able to or be ready to come back to continue our work together. And I said, thank you for telling me. To imagine being told the truth is is an incredible thing. To be trusted, you know, to share. I was really moved by that. I could imagine how they must have wondered. They don't wonder now. No, of course not. We're there. Did you wonder? No. You knew immediately that... I never questioned it for an instant. About yourself. No, I never questioned it. So we have a lot to talk about, <laughs> but that does bring <laughs> me to a couple of points is that, and one is an overall observation that I wanted to share with you, because I've been thinking about this all morning, that you have always struck me, and I alluded to some of this at the beginning of our conversation, you've always struck me as such a grounded, thoughtful I want to say, and I don't know if this is quite the right words, but it's slow paced, meaning you you do things very intentionally, very thoughtfully. I don't imagine you rushing around (laughs) and very graceful. Thank you. Where do you get that from? Did you grow up in in the Northwest? Initially in Montana and then the Northwest. I think it's from my mother and her mother. Did you know your grandmother well? I knew her very well. From the time I was I was really like a year old when my dad left for World War II. He was a Marine. He signed up for the Marines and left for for the war when I was less than a year old. And my mother and my sister, who's four years older than I, my sister Charlene and I all moved in with my grandparents, with my mother's parents in Lewistown, Montana. My mother worked in a bank. She had started working in a bank after she graduated from high school at age 16. Wow. Amazing. A time when women didn't really work. In 1936. Sure. 1936. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother was a phenomenal baker. Everything she made tasted just like love. And she made pies and rolls for the local restaurants in Lewistown. So she baked every day. And she would put me, I was little, so she'd put me on her baker's table, you know, right here in the corner and hand me bits of dough Mm -hmm. and just kind of, kind of teach me how to mold bits of dough into something that we call essential goodness. (laughs) And I think that's where it came from. You know, I, of course it did. I think I, there was a genetic transfer Mm -hmm. and it's why baking is such a huge part of my life. And at the same time, my mother, a very big-spirited, high-spirited, very clear, one step at a time, banker, and take care of our family. She worked full-time my whole life. I mean, my whole life until I, you know, after I graduated from 
high school and left and left home to begin working. So I think it's in between my grandmother and my mother. I think what came from my mother and my grandmother, but I really think about it from my mother, is a very deep keel. She had a deep keel to, to withstand big storms. And I think she shared that with me, particularly when she passed away last year. That's what I felt most of all is, you know, she let me know, okay, I'm passing this to you. So be mindful of the deep keel. So thank you for, thanks for asking me about that. You have needed a deep keel at times. You mentioned it, maybe this was before we were recording, you mentioned just in the last few years, but I mean, for me, it goes back much longer than that because I really know you from, from Danan, right? And I can only imagine what you went through at that time, losing someone who 800 people at his, you know, at his service, at his celebration. Yes. That's a much, that's a big personality and a much loved person. Yes. And not to take away from uh, someone that we lose that has had a lesser influence on the world. But that's a big, that's a big thing. And you, you stood up, at least from the outside, I saw you stood up with grit and grace. Thank and you. And continued on. <laughs> that's what it takes. Yeah. It took grace. You know, Ken Wilber wrote a book entitled Grace and Grit. And I think that's what it really is. Because there is a grace that comes. We just trust it to come in. And it's grit as well as what it really takes to stay present when life changes in an instant and the life I had was not the life I thought I would have. That's probably a big part of the integrative process is this is, you know, the, so it's been 22 years since he passed away and I really fully, truly accept as one of my friends said, I think Danan was called on a spiritual journey, on a spiritual errand. I think he was called on a spiritual errand. And I thought, that sounds about right. So to ultimately come to acceptance, which that, to that, which I resisted. And I did resist, though I needed to stay engaged the whole time and never, ever, ever give up. And Keep. Because you had people relying on you, yes, then. and of course the Vietnamese, and and they, I I learned more about death and dying from the Vietnamese people than I've ever learned anywhere. I mean, how they accept and their condolences and all the ways they have so been been kind and caring to me, and how they honor the dead, too. yes, and how they honor the dead, and and they respect it, and there's never anything like minimizing or snap out of it as I heard from other places. So those were very formative years. And in those years, I was, I had sold my bakery cafe. Um, so Gerilyn, I just have to say, yes. most people say their formative years are when they're 12 and 13. <laughs> oh. <laughs> when I hear that word formative, yes. that's the way I talk about myself. It's like my teen years. But here you're, re formative years. You're, you're redefining it. <laughs> And you're saying this is... Yeah, I was in my 50s. You grew up mm -hmm. in a whole different way. Mm -hmm. Those were formative years of coming to terms with his passing, of peace trees had been started with the most, the deepest heart and soul and spirit and biggest vision. And of course, we were spot on with that and not knowing. I call it the land of I don't know because vision often includes what we don't know. And at the same time, uh, settling Dana's affairs and working. I was then, I was primarily consulting with Cinnabon. I'd sold my bakery um, just before Dana and I were married and moved to Bainbridge Island. So I had just sold my, I had just sold my bakery three years before. And your bakery being in Edmonds, Brousseau's. it was called Brousseau's mm -hmm. in Edmonds. It was a French bakery and sidewalk cafe. Mm -hmm that we had for 16 years. And all the food was from local farms, which I drove all the valleys, the byways and highways, back roads of the valleys with ingredients from local farms before there were farmer's markets. There were not farmer's markets in those days. 
And at that time, in 1996, I was working with Cinnabon to create additional products for their their collection of new products after we had created Cinnabon in the first place. So that was all part of my integrative journey. I remember that after Dana passed away, the CEO of Cinnabon invited me to join him for lunch every Wednesday at what was then the Olympic Hotel. Remember mm-hmm. when it was called the Olympic Hotel? In that beautiful patio room, that terrace room. So every Wednesday we met there for lunch. He was so kind to me. Who was that? Dennis Waldron was his name. Give him a little shout out there. Yeah, yes, it was. Oh, it's those things that count. Mm-hmm. That really counted. My friend Eric van Prague called me from Amsterdam. He was actually Danan's, one of Danan's closest friends in Europe. For one year after Danan passed away, he called me every Sunday to say hello and share his love, which was so meaningful to me. And my life was composed of all those things, weaving together all those threads and my family, grandchildren being born, trips to Vietnam, and more consulting, which I've continued to do these years, and as Peace Trees has grown and grown and grown. And now, I would say, in our 23rd year, we're starting our 24th year, Peace Trees is the strongest we've ever been. We have an extraordinary staff in Seattle. I would love to introduce you to our executive director, Claire Yunker. She's brilliant mm-hmm. and to doing her. a brilliant she's conducting a beautiful leadership role of integrating both teams here in seattle team with our on the ground team in vietnam they have zoom calls once a week for their staff meetings isn't that fantastic mm-hmm. with the people in vietnam mm-hmm. oh, technology huh? yeah. yeah changed everything mm-hmm. yes hey let's go back to cinnabon because I don't want to gloss over that because that's, that's <laughs> I mean, really, it's, it's fun and it's what a lot of people know you for. And I know a little bit about the story, but I'd love to hear in your words kind of how that whole thing developed because I think, and talk about what you're doing now because I think you have these two parts of your world, very much about peace trees and Vietnam and the humanitarian work that you're doing. But you also have this love and this gift that you learned from your grandmother from a very early age when you were rolling out dough and you learned her recipes, <laughs> right? I did. So I did. what? How, mm-hmm. how did Cinnabon and, a, and your cinnamon roll come about? It came about on an ordinary day in 1985 at Brousseau's in Edmonds, our bakery cafe. Our cook had called in sick that day. So I was cooking. I was in the kitchen, in our tiny kitchen. And there was, in in those days, in 1985, um, the technology was quite simple. It consisted of running a restaurant required a telephone, a steno pad and a pencil, and a cash register. (laughs) And so I was in the kitchen. There was a phone right right by the stove and a phone in the front of the cafe. And I was chopping away and the phone rang and I knew they were busy in the front. So I picked up the phone and I answered, hello, this is Rousseau's, may I help you? And this voice at the other end said, hi, Geraldine, this is Rich Komen. And I said, wow, Rich, great to hear from you. He is, Rich Komen is the founder and at that time was the CEO of Restaurants Unlimited, a highly respected restaurant group in Seattle. You'll recognize the Palomino name probably oh, yeah, that's in many cities, but mm-hmm. Rich then had 21 restaurants, and I had recently catered an event for his managers with ingredients from many local farms and farmers, and I loved that he was calling me. So, hey, Gerlin. Hi, Rich. He said, how'd you like to create the world's greatest cinnamon roll? And I said, (laughs) yum. You bet. (laughs) Let's do it. And so we did. His idea was to create a cinnamon roll so delicious, so irresistible that people would stand in line in a shopping mall for 14 minutes to have a fresh, hot from the oven roll. And so we began. He turned his test kitchen at their beautiful home office in Seattle, turned the test kitchen into a bakery literally overnight and had their their corporate chef do his work at one of the other restaurants because we filled up the test kitchen with 
a proof cabinet, heavy duty mixer, you know, like mm-hmm. a 20 quart mixer to mix dough. And we bags of flour everywhere like you see in my kitchen mm-hmm. right now. Yeah, your bags of grains. Yeah, there yeah. are mm-hmm. eight 50 pound bags of flour wow. over there. And we started with his team. So Rich, the founder and CEO, his senior vice president, Ray Lindstrom, his vice president, Rick Gibney, and his purchasing agent, Dave Johnson, and myself. So I like to call myself the hired rolling pin <laughs> in the project. And I think they that's were, the best job. It, it was a good job. <laughs> and we created a criteria and a language and attributes. How would we know when we got there? How would we know when we had the world's greatest cinnamon roll? So we created attributes of pillowy, moist, a cinnamon hit, 7.5 wraps, irresistible, even if you're not hungry. What's 7.5 wraps? Wraps. So the wraps oh, right. in a row. The circulars. The, cir- okay. the spiral wraps okay. in the Got roll. Got it. Got it. Mm-hmm. A creamy, delicious frosting. Mm-hmm. My mouth's watering. Mm -hmm. And we started out with, of course, my grandmother's cinnamon rolls because I learned that they had been conducting research around the country when Rich made this decision to pursue this big project that they sent scouts out to different bakeries and cafes around the country and brought them into the home office and tested them. And my grandmother's cinnamon rolls from Brousseau's were the winner. Mm -hmm. Thus the phone call. Yeah. So we started with my grandmother's recipe that I've been making since I was a child and began the testing right there and then. So we tested every day. We had, we tasted, we, every morning I would get up, go in and open my own bakery and cafe and make sure everything was all set for lunch to start at 11 o'clock. I would leave at 1030 and buzz downtown in my Volkswagen van to the Restaurants Unlimited test kitchen and In the door and the flour would fly and mix, mix, mix that day's tests. And at five o'clock that day, just as people were about to go home, (laughs) they would be coming. We would invite them in the test kitchen to test that day's results. So it was quite an extraordinary experience for me. I will say it was one of the highlights of my culinary career. Why is that? It was my first experience ever of creating a result to meet another's set of expectations. Rich had a quality of rigor that was unbelievable. And I loved it. No compromise anywhere. Never. I mean, for an example, if I was rolling the dough, a four pound ball of dough, rolling the dough, I'd been mi- I'd mixed it, let it rise, and I chilled it for overnight proofing. And then I rolled it out to the exact measurements in the triangle. And I spread the triangle with eight ounces of butter. And I spread it with 16.5 or 20.5 ounces of cinnamon and brown sugar. Let's say 20.5 ounces, Rich would say, after it was all done, what if we did 20.75? <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, well, it was enlivening for me. And I have a lot of science in me. I was in pre-med. I, I loved science. I'm a scientist in some ways, especially with food. Well, so, that's what baking is all about. It is. Though, right? it is ex- the precision. It is precision. Yes. I have stacks. I should show you. I have stacks of yellow pads because I track every single formula. I write every single formula I do for all but, these years. And by formula, you mean recipe. recipe, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And every single thing is weighed and measured. So, every single thing is weighed. So every every time you went in to work in the kitchen to develop the recipe, was it a, it was a new, one new recipe a day? Or a variance on the day before. Well, or a variance on the day before. So it was always, it was always one tweak. You weren't saying, okay, today I'm going to do a double batch and I'm going to do the 20.5 ounces on this one and I'm going to do 21 ounces on this one. No, only one change at a time. Okay. So these are some of the rigors I learned. Mm -hmm. You ever only change one variable. There's only one variable at a time. Otherwise, you would never know its outcome. If you change two things, how would you know which one was influential? So here's what happened. 
every day I would mix, right, treat the dough beautifully to the same, whatever those tests were that day. And we came to this moment where I would roll the dough, spread it with butter, brown sugar, and cinnamon. And by the way, we had cinnamon school because in those days we didn't have single source products, identity preserved products. There was cinnamon. We didn't know it was from Vietnam, India, China, Malaysia, Mexico, the Caribbean. We didn't know all that. So we had cinnamon school that was then called Crescent Spice. But Crescent Spice was the leading spice company. I called them. I happened to know one of their people and said, we're doing this cinnamon roll. We're using the freshest, most high quality ingredients for it. We'd like to learn everything you can teach us about cinnamon. So we had cinnamon school and we learned which countries and we tasted. So we selected the highest quality, highest volatile oil cinnamon at that time available in the U.S. was from Sumatra. And cinnamon grows at elevations like coffee does from, you know, there's there's Robusta coffee and then there's Arabica coffee. Well, cinnamon is in the same categories. The higher the elevation, the higher the quality of the cinnamon. So the highest volatile oil, Karinji cinnamon. And then cinnamon, Cinnabon would I mean, the company would then ultimately create their own brand for that cinnamon. So that was the one we used. It has a fabulous flavor and aroma. And that was part of our testing as well. So we came to this point, I will say, probably five weeks into the project, where every day I would do the repetitious steps to to demonstrate one change. And we began seeing a very disturbing pattern that I would prepare the dough, seven point, every single attribute, attribute 7.5 wraps, proof the rolls, beautiful rising into the oven. Here was the key. The non-negotiable aspect of this project is that the roll must be baked in a convection oven, which no one had heard of at that time, in a convection oven, which means the heat is driven by a fan in 14 minutes. That was Rich, Rich's founding premise. Mm -hmm. Because people were waiting for the cinnamon roll. Because and he was a statistician and he had done extensive research to know that 14 minutes was the longest time people would wait in line. Mm -hmm. So the roll would go into the oven. I would watch. the. I, would, I could see it through the glass door. The rolls would rise beautifully, coming up, coming up. They would brown beautifully. I would pull them out of the oven. They looked perfect for about one minute. And then they would begin to collapse, but not horizontally. They would collapse vertically. So the sides of the wraps would cave in like this. Mm -hmm. With your cheeks, you're pulling like, your cheeks in. Like your in, cheeks yeah. in, you know, like pull your cheeks in. And what would remain was this browned spiral hanging in space. Uh, and all the dough was unbaked uh -huh, underneath uh -huh. it. So we worked for more than four or five more weeks on that, that wow, what is this? What is this? What is this? We would look at it this way and we'd look at it that way and we'd change this step and we would change that step. We would still have the same results. And other people were starting to tell Rich that they knew better, that they could do it. And there was a group in Seattle who told him that they were pretty sure they had the role for him and we could just come down and taste it. So we got in Rich's car, beautiful, gorgeous sports car, and drove down to this company and they had all their bakers there and they brought out these large cardboard boxes that were filled with large cinnamon rolls. And they opened the boxes and said, see, we've got it for you. His is... And Rich and I got, so we tasted them and said, thank you very much. And went on our way. And clearly that was not the role we had in mind. They weren't grandmas. They weren't my grandmothers. And later that day, I was driving across the ship canal bridge in Seattle, the place where inspirations came to me a lot. <laughs> and I was thinking about, what is it? And suddenly I tuned into my grandmother and what she could have had in her cupboard in her Montana ranch house that could have cushioned the dough from the convection fan. Because I believed it was that the dough was being driven to rise so quickly that it was then collapsing. And later I was in the car with Rich 
and he said, what do you think it is? And I said, I think I have it. Let's stop at the store. <laughs> so we did. And I made a quick trip in the store and for an ingredient or two. And we raced back to the test kitchen. I mixed the next batch and it came out mm -hmm. perfectly. That was the day, November 11th, 1985. We reached WOW. What was the secret ingredient? That's their secret. Mm. <laughs> Are you yeah. on under, under an NDA with them? Oh, of course. Of course, of course, of course. I don't know. I, you go to the bathroom and I'll be rifling <laughs> around in your drawers here looking for the recipe. You probably know it like the back of your hand, I don't do. you? I yeah. do, yeah. So that was the day we reached WOW, November 11th, 1985. And the first bakery opened December 4th. Whoa. A few 1985. weeks. 1985. Yeah, a few weeks later. Mm -hmm. Were you uh, invested literally in Cinnabon? Well, spiritually, yes. I'm very deeply spiritually invested in Cinnabon. I was paid well for my work. For your, you were paid for your recipe, not as was, a, like a founder of. Correct. Of mm -hmm. Cinnabon. Okay. Yes. I won't get into your personals, but I, I'm just, I was just curious how that worked because I was thinking that you were the founder of Cinnabon, but you, you created, you're the Cinnamom. You're the, you're the recipe. Yes. That's what my chef's coat says. Yeah. Cinnamom. The yes. Cinnamom. And I cherish my relationship with the Coleman family. Greg Coleman is the president of the franchise, uh, franchisee advisory council. And he's I the son of, of Rick? Rich Coleman. Rich, Rich. And I worked with Greg. Greg opened that first bakery at SeaTac Mall. I consider their family to have to be of the highest integrity. And I'm so loyal to them. Mm -hmm. And to the company, I, I do television spots for them and cooking shows and things like that from do, time to time. Has the recipe changed over the years, do you no. know? It hasn't at mm -hmm. all. So they, no. they maintain that. Mm -hmm. They have other ways to mix the doughs. I mean, they have, they now have rolls that are frozen that can be purchased that, you know, for quick service in other places, but it's the original formula. Do you know how many calories is in one of those? I don't. <laughs> I don't. There used to be this place up on Finney Ridge, Near us. We used to live near the Woodland Park Zoo, and there was a place up the street, Maze Finney Ridge Cafe. Oh, I remember that. Yeah, great place. It's closed now, but they had cinnamon rolls. I don't know. You're looking at my hands in a circular. They're Giant. Six inches across, seven inches across, mm -hmm. 1,600 calories <laughs> for one oh, of those. And yeah. I think people bought those and ate them, ate one. Mm -hmm. That's Probably they did. That's probably, I mean, really, That's a day's. You, you should have, it's a day's worth of calories, but mm -hmm. you should split that into eight. If you're having that with breakfast, that should be eight pieces, right? 200 calories yeah. each with eggs or whatever else you're eating. But yeah. that's why I asked about that because I'll never forget looking at the calorie count on that cinnamon roll, 1600. Next time I go to the mall, I'm going to check that because I'm sure now, because we have Washington state laws now that... Uh, chain restaurants have to show the number of calories in a in a product. Oh, it's so, I'm sure it's there. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure it is too. I'm sure it's there. So Cinnabon has their classic size and then they have minis. So that's those are fun. What huh, fun. You could eat six of those. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I oh, ran I it, love them. I ran it, I oh I know. Me too. <laughs> that's what I'm saying, but uh, I ran 18 miles this morning. So, so you can you have would, one. You yes. You would think. You would think. Do you always have um cinnamon rolls on hand? Do you keep them in your freezer or is it a special occasion? I don't occasion? ever freeze them, but I make them a lot. Okay. I make cinnamon rolls really a lot mm -hmm. because I'm working now with a stone grinding mill in the Skagit Valley north of Seattle. It's a mill that is the outgrowth of the Washington State University bread lab where plant geneticists are breeding traditional grains from non ancient grains. Non-GMO non-GMO, the opposite of genetically modified. And local farmers and regional farmers are growing these heirloom grains. Some of them have attributes back to the 10th century. And I work with a mill called Cairn Spring Mill in Burlington, Washington. Cairn, C-A-I-R-N. Like Cairn, like stones. Right. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. Cairn Spring. And I am a, I'm a research and development baker for them. And I serve on their board so these grains are incredible. They're the most lively, vital grains I've ever worked with in my life. 
So these grains are milled to preserve 85% of the food value or all of the food value in a whole grain. And they're not, they don't go through steel roller mills like, like has taken over in our country. We, 25 years ago, had something close to 24,000 stone grinding mills. 100 years ago, we had 24,000 stone grinding mills in our country where farmers could take their grains and have them ground in a stone mill that would preserve the vitamins and minerals and food value of the grain, of the wheat germ, of the endosperm of the wheat. But now, 100 years later, we have 195 mills. And we, have to f- and we have to fortify our grains because we've taken out all the nutrients they take, from them. Yeah. The, all the mills are owned by four companies now. And most of them have, you know, they, they find, they, they pool the companies, bring together grains from all over the world to have the longest shelf stable time. Did you read the book Wheat to Belly? No. I can't recall the author of him, but I did read that book. And much of the concentration of that is about what we've done to our wheat and how we've stripped it and how so many people have issues with gluten because it is a very different grain today than it was when our grandmothers were baking. And that's why back right. then, you know, there were more nutrients and mm-hmm. uh, and people weren't having the gluten issues that they're having right now. So I was just wondering, it sounds like you probably understand that better than I anybody do. else. You didn't need to Well, not better than anyone, it, but-, but I'm just amazed at the commentary coming back to this mill from people who are runners, who couldn't tolerate gluten at all. And now with these grains, because they're not treated in any way, there are no chemicals added to them. They're grown, harvested, cleaned, milled, and there are no additives of any kind. So they're fresh and delicious. We don't even, we don't even realize right. we don't realize. what's going on. Because as you're explaining this to me, I just had no idea. I go to the grocery store. I might go to the PCC. I might go to a co-op and buy something that's a, a higher quality. Like, that's a higher quality. Mm-hmm. But even that, I'm sure, is nowhere near what you're talking about. Right. These grains are so delicious. How I can, never get stomach aches from these grains. How can we find them? We now in Seattle have one retail customer, Metropolitan Market in Seattle. Oh, is, is it ca- the Met Market? Yeah, Met Market oh, is good. carrying. Um, uh, it's a co-branded Met Market Cairn Spring okay. Mill. Pastry flour, bread flour, and and all purpose flour, and they're all organic. I'm going to go buy on some. the shelves. Yeah, I'm going to make my own cinnamon rolls. Yes, you can. Back. Yes, not with your use recipe. the all purpose. Use the all the purpose, all purpose mm-hmm. for it. Okay, I'll give you my recipe. I'll show you my recipe anytime. No, I'll give you my recipe. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I don't mean to be sound disappointed, but okay. I'll no, take, my recipe I'll, is great. I make I'll, them all the time. I'll take your recipe. <laughs> you mean you don't make the cinnamon the cinnabon recipe when you make them? Well, that's Cinnabon's recipe. I make I my grandmother's recipe. Okay. I will accept Grandma. What's her name? Your grandma's Her name was Maud Spurgeon. Maud. I'll take Grandma Maud's Yes. I'll give you a copy of it, it when okay. we finish. I would love that. And anyone else who'd like it. And I'll take pictures and I'll post the pictures. Well, that'd be fun. <laughs> On it too. Yes. Yeah. I'll do a little, I'll do my own little test kitchen. That'd be and great. then we'll have our neighbors over because I was telling you earlier that we have a we have a neighbor event where, and I'll just go ahead and explain it to, to listeners so they're in the loop with it. We do tea, coffee, muffins, and we invite the neighbors over on, we might do it. We share the kind of share the duties with our, our next door neighbor. So we, between us, we might have it three or four times a year. Come over on a Saturday morning, 10 o'clock, 10 to 12, bring a coffee cup. Don't bring anything else because we don't, we just, <laughs> just, we want you to come and just be relaxed and not have to stress over making something and I'll make muffins or cinnamon rolls and just come over and have a chat and get to know your neighbors. And we do that because we love our neighbors. Neighbors are awesome. So now I have something new to practice. I won't do it every day. I won't yes. practice every day until yes. I get it right. Yes. But I will practice that. That's so, great. Yeah. So you are still involved. And I said this earlier, you've got Two pieces of your world, Vietnam and peace trees, and the amazing humanitarian work. And you are working. Yes. And still developing. You're still working in the uh, in the uh, culinary world. Yes. You're also you're you're possibly getting back into running. 
because we we talked about this a little bit. You've done yes. You've done a few half marathons. Yes. But you got a little sidetracked a year ago. What happened? I had uh, an unpredictable accident in my doctor's office. I fell. It like actually in your doctor's office. Exactly in my doctor's office. Tripped mm-hmm. over something. Yes, there was. I was standing next to an exam table that had the foot of the table on my left. And I was standing, um, i just seen the doctor. I was talking with the nurse and my son who was there with me. And the doctor had gone out. We'd finished and I was so happy I didn't need to have surgery. And as we were finishing our conversation, I was realizing it was time for me to you know, reach for my clothes and change back into my street clothes. And what I didn't know is that that table had not only a step at the foot of the step, which was on my, at the foot of the table, which was on my left. That exam table had a pullout step that was on my right. And someone had pulled it out for me. Earlier in the appointment, I was sitting across the room and there were no steps along this table. So when I reached for my clothes on the hook, like to my right, I moved my left foot maybe an inch or so or maybe an inch and a half to the right and there was enough momentum in my reaching up that my ankle hit that step and I flew across the room and hit my head very hard on the wall. I landed on my right wrist and got a complex fracture of my right wrist, tore the rotator cuff in my right shoulder and was and, there anyone else in the room with you? Yes, my son and the okay, nurse were okay. there and landed on my left shoulder as well. Mm. So I have two torn rotator cuffs Ooh. and I, I had a big surgery on my arm and it's recovering on my wrist because I'm a baker. I mean, I need my fingers on my right hand. That's how I test pike pastry. That's how I test doughs. I mean, I need my hands and... So it's been a long journey of recovery for, and I think to share this with friends is something really important because I don't usually ask for help. I'm not really good at it. And I've lived um, as, you know, I live in my home and I love it and I live my life and I have great kids and great grandchildren. And I'm, you know, I take care of myself. I'm self-generating. And suddenly I found myself almost a year ago, it'll be a year ago next week, I could not use either of my arms. And one of my friends generated a team of people, of 38 people. Hmm. Here on the island? Here on Bainbridge. Mm -hmm. Who rotated every morning, every late afternoon or evening, every day for almost four months. Coming to stay with you? Coming or- to make breakfast for me, to help me take a shower. I couldn't step in the shower, so they would drive me to their house and help me in a shower. They would do laundry for me, put dishes in the... I, I couldn't use either arm. It were, was Were they in casts, or were they just so painful that you could My right arm was in, a, was, in a, a, was, was in a cast for three weeks, and then I had surgery, <laughs> and it was really in a cast. So it was, it yes, it was in a cast to my elbow and extremely painful. Both, b- both of my arms were in a lot of pain. So my friends would be with me and support me. And I am so grateful. I am so grateful to have lived through that season. And I've been thinking about, I want to call each of them now and tell them what a profound difference they made in my life. It was, it was a dark night of the soul experience because I was registered to run the half marathon in June. I run for leukemia lymphoma research because my daughter-in-law was diagnosed with stage four Hodgkin's when she was 10 weeks pregnant with her second child. And they both lived. And that is a miracle. So forever, I want to give back to the leukemia lymphoma research. So the disappointment of missing that race was incredible. I had to, and I had to really come to terms with myself in ways, probably ways that I never had. I couldn't pretend that I could run. 
I couldn't run. And I couldn't pretend that I could that do you anything. Could, yeah, that you could cook or do laundry. I couldn't yeah. drive my car. How, that must have been frustrating to have to rely on your friends. Or are you, are you the type of person that can accept that pretty easily? I didn't think I was a person who could accept it. And I did accept it. I was so grateful because I was a, I was a mess. You know, I was, I was untidy. Everything was untidy in my life. <laughs> Nothing was tied up with pink ribbons, you know? Mm-hmm. My kids were really concerned. Oh my gosh, I live on a farm, five acres. I have work to do here. I couldn't do anything. Just brought everything to a standstill, huh? It did. And so I think it's really important for me to reach out to each of the women. They were just awesome. And one one fellow who is my, my sole brother, I adopted him to be my brother after my brother Dan was killed. In fact, he was here today. Um, he's a fantastic human being. And he helped me a lot as well. But the ways in which people helped me, and then when I could slowly start working again, I could I could do some parts of baking, but I couldn't do all. So these wonderful, amazing people would come and open and close the oven door and lift in cast iron pots that were filled with rising bread and all these things that would happen, load my car, turn the cinnamon rolls out of the pan. Mm. I mean, they were just, so it's like having a doula. You know, when you have a baby, there's a doula helping you in a postpartum doula. It was like having a doula, a cooking doula, Mm -hmm. a baking doula. They were amazing. I want to come just intern for you. Okay. (laughs) We could do that. I would love to. (laughs) Wow. Well, that that is great that you had such support here. Such support. Yeah. Yes. But uh, so you're just getting back to thinking. You haven't started running yet, have you? Not yet. I'm just, I'm coming to terms with, I want to run a half marathon in 2019. Yeah. yeah. When you start to get itchy like that, it's a good feeling. Every day I look up the what Leukemia Lymphoma Research Team and Training is doing today. And I'm going to call my friend. I think I mentioned this too earlier. My my friend is the executive director for the Northwest region, and I'm going to call her tomorrow and talk with her about how have people previously worked with healing shoulders and running, because I can do that. If she doesn't have an answer, let me know, because okay. I know physical therapists, and I know people who... Uh, who who might be able to give you some direction with that. If yeah, she can, I have physical therapists. Okay. But... Yeah, let maybe you know people specifically who have run. Could be. Because we don't know how long it's going to take for my shoulders. Mm -hmm. And someone listening might say, but you don't run with your shoulders. But there's a lot of... Oh, but you have a lot of shoulder motion when you're running. Yeah, And there's a lot of pounding too. Right. If I do a a marathon or if I do... uh, I didn't feel it. Maybe I'll feel it tomorrow. I didn't didn't feel it today. Sometimes I I do a long run, 20, 22 miles. And I get in the shower. That's can, a long run. I can feel it in my arms, which is really weird. But it's the pounding. You know, it's just the pounding. Yes. That's a, it's a weird thing. But yeah, there's pounding. Yeah. So I can see how in your shoulders. Do you mind telling us how old you are? I'm 75. And you're proud. You're proud. Darn right. That. That's awesome. Yes. You know, I, I know that uh, for me, age, age is just a number. And it's not, I ran my first marathon at 50. And I know you started running in your 40s. I don't think age matters, but it doesn't. (laughs) Because, I mean, look at you talking about running a half marathon and you're 75. And there's, you know, uh, you know, my goal is to be, you know, to win the New York marathon at the whatever at at 95, right? You know, like, why not? Right? Yes. Because people are doing that. Yes. And I think it's really important to look to people who are who are ahead of us yes. doing these amazing things. I do too. And not being dispirited by uh, kind of the buying into whatever television is telling us or the news is telling us about aging. John yes. and I John and I have a thing where we won't talk about we won't talk about age or issues that we're having. It's Mm -hmm. just, it is language that is not allowed in our house. Yes. And I think it's better to kind of be in denial about it because you're scrunching your nose. Is that an agreement? No, I'm not denying it. It's simply that I am the same person I was when I was 30 and 40 and 50. I have 
my aspirations, my I know when I'm really stretching out. I know when I'm not doing enough. I I know that I have a big job in the universe to do, and I'm not stopping it. There's so much here to be done on earth. And my mother, um, I think I, I told you a little bit earlier that my mother was extraordinary. She passed away last year at age 97. She was a full-on rock star. She made the decision to go to Vietnam when she was 90 <laughs> and meet with a Vietnamese mother who was 92, who had lost her two sons when the war passed by their village. And she was a champion. All of her, the, she was on national television live receiving an award from, on behalf of the president and the prime minister of Vietnam. She had a, it's her spirit. So I feel that spirit of there's so much to give and do. And I love my little cottage. I love this farm. I love working with farmers and plant geneticists, making these incredible products out of their grains and being at the table with the Vietnamese families, hearing their experience of losing their pilot like our family did. I mean, there's so much in life to distill and be fueled by, and there's always a difference to make. Is that what keeps you going? Yes. Making a difference? Yes. You said earlier, you know yourself, you know when you're not doing enough. How do you pull yourself out of that? How, what, what, what does that mean to you not doing enough? How do you recognize that? And then what do you do to pull yourself out of it? Mm -hmm. That's exactly how I felt during these months of being, well, incapacitated, unable to move either of my arms. So I had a choice of getting depressed and feeling bad. I had a few moments like that or of going with it. But you recognize that it was a choice. Yes. And I had the same choice when my husband died instantly when he was 56 and I was 53. I mean... I knew I had a choice right there and then. I could resist and go in the pattern of that had been established in my family of alcohol and other things, or I could stay present and go as deep as the journey took me. And that's really my commitment is to go as deep as it takes. And going as deep as it took having both of my arms incapacitated, I could have been daunted, but I wasn't. And and I really couldn't always see the light. But I was so determined that, I mean, my life is so important. And I have ways I can give that are not just with my arms. You know, I love public speaking and I love, I love speaking to lift the human spirit. That's my favorite. And I give a lot of talks. So that's a way that I can make a difference still. Did you spend a lot of that time reading? No. What did you do? I didn't read. It took most of a day to figure out just how to navigate the day. And I kept up with my client and I kept up with Peace Trees by using voice text. And I learned this voice uh, generated typing on a computer so that I would, and so that took a long time, very slow, mm-hmm. but I was deliberate mm-hmm. because I saw how, and I've heard and I've sensed people feeling like they didn't have gifts to share and kind of stepping back from living life vibrantly. And I just thought, no way, vibrant, vibrant life. My mother's steps, you know? Yeah. She was still teaching people to play bridge when she was 95. You know, normally I might say like good genes, but it's not just the genes. No. It's just, it's the example. That's yes. the key is having that example. Yes. And we just need to make sure that we surround ourselves with those kinds of people. You know, they say that you are most influenced by the five people who are around you. Oh, There's something great. I like about that. that. Yeah. Well, you like that. But mm-hmm. if you, but there might be somebody who doesn't have access or doesn't have those mentors or those family members. And you just, you have to consciously change who you're around so that you 
so that the people who are around you are the positive influence. Absolutely. Absolutely. Do you remember the play, The Little Mermaid? Yeah. My grandson was in that play earlier this year, and there's a line about positivity. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of my words is positivity. Yeah. That being positive, authentic. I value authenticity and positivity and more than anything, relationships. I think that's the center post of my life is deepening relationships. Like with the Vietnamese, transforming former adversaries into allies and partners. And developing relationships with farmers, plant geneticists, bakers, bringing more and more vitality into the world of baking for people and more nutrition and health. You're literally breaking bread with people. <laughs> literally, yeah. Mm -hmm. In so many ways. Is there anything that we didn't chat about today as we kind of wrap up here? Is there anything else that you wanted to bring up or talk about that I might have missed? I think we've, I think we've covered it. Maybe my grandchildren, like what it means to have grandchildren. My grandchildren are, I mean, my, I have three, my three kids, each, my son, Jeffrey and his wife, Karen, my son, Tim and his wife, Kelly, and my daughter, Mari and her husband, Rick. They mean the world to me. As much as I love Vietnam and would love to live in Vietnam, I need to be here for my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And how many grandkids? Six. Six grandkids. Mm -hmm. I ran into my neighbor. I, I hear the women on my tours, I hear them gushing about their grandkids or posting on <laughs> Facebook, you know, yes. the photos of their grandkids and talking about them. And I don't have kids myself, so I, I don't relate to it. But I ran into my neighbor lovely woman. I ran into her the other day. I was walking up through our alley and she was just getting in the car and she said, come, come meet my granddaughter, Kyla. And she's Kyla's two and a half or something. And she's sitting in the back seat and we're having this big conversation about Christmas and Santa coming and all this stuff. And my neighbor was just gushing. And I realized, I was like, oh, it's breathing. I think at it, and, I, and I'm not making a judgment on you at all. I'm saying in general, kind of this time of life for women, kind of this age. I don't want to say middle age because I think middle age is much older <laughs> now, right? Mm -hmm. But let's just say um, at an age when there are empty nesters and there's this time period, maybe between 50 and 60, when they're a little bit alone, mm -hmm. then the grandkids come and it breathes new life in them. And it was the first time I realized when I saw my neighbor with her granddaughter, I was like, oh, this isn't just about gushing over the grandkid. This is about breathing new life and really, in a way, giving life to, yes. this, to this child because yes. you're molding yes. them and influencing them in yes. this whole other way. I'm not telling you anything that... Mm -hmm. um, how many people are on the pop in the, <laughs> what's the population of the planet? <laughs> 7 billion or something. I'm not telling you anything that, you know, three and a half billion other people don't already know. They knew well in advance of me, but I finally got it. I finally it's your got discovery. It. It's, it is my that discovery. it's very life-giving and it's purposeful when you realize that there are these little people that are continuing the wheel of life yeah. from your own genes uh -huh. and that there is a way for you to be infusing life and spirit and love into mm -hmm. their lives. And it's a, it's a, uh, it's another way of giving back, giving of service, being of service. Like you are yes. doing work outside of your family that yes. is as, uh, that's of service. I like to think that things that many things that I do are of service to other people Yes, in different ways. But I, f I see it. I finally got it. I was like, ah, oh, okay, I get it. I got life. I understood life in that moment. <laughs> yes. So anyway, that's just all to say. I understand I understand where you're coming from with the grandkids. So mm -hmm. that's great. Yeah. Good. Well, thanks for giving a shout out to them. As I wrap up each conversation, I ask my guest, what does it mean to you to be bold? Hmm. It means being willing to be in the land of I don't know and to be fueled by a purpose much higher than my life and to continue stepping into it. So there's bravery 
and courage, but it's very different than that. When my mother was alive, we had these great conversations about living on the tips of the skinny branches because I've spent much of my life really sticking my neck out. And I I always laughed with my mom and told her that, you know, it's really not crowded up here. (laughs) It's never crowded on the tips of the skinny branches. Mm -hmm. But taking steps that feel completely in, I love this question. It's giving me a way to look differently. I like the word bold. I don't think about it very often. But you are bold. Thank you. <laughs> you. I mean, you're living such a bold life. I know. I stick my neck out all the time. Yesterday morning at 310, when my alarm went off and I got up to go to the bread lab, beautiful bakery, to turn on all, all the lights at 430, and I had three and a half hours to finish baking in two very complex ovens these seven products for a very distinguished guest. I was thinking, this is really cool because I'm trusting myself fully that I can master the mechanics of these electric of the electronics in these ovens. I can calculate the rising and baking time of each of these items, and I had this very precise time window. Right. That was bold. (laughs) Engaging for the past year with my beloved sister-in-law, Gail, who was engaged to be married to my brother, Dan. For one year, we planned her trip to Vietnam to be the fulfillment of her vision that would bring her close to that moment she was envisioning for remembering Dan and his co-pilot on the 50th anniversary, which I considered to be very courageous of her. And for my part of it, I, I knew that this was a bold step for my leadership to accompany her and her family and our helicopter pilot. So six of them who had never been, our one pilot had never been back to Vietnam But none of them in the group had ever been to Vietnam as currently. And I knew that it was a very large task, like a spiritual task. It was not leading a group. I've led dozens of groups of citizen diplomacy groups to Vietnam. But this was a spiritual journey. And the requested plans for visits, things that were outside are typical stop. Inviting the U.S. ambassador to have lunch with us on Sunday between Christmas and New Year's because the embassy was closed and that would be the one time we could see him. And he said, yes. <laughs> there, were, there were so many steps in this journey that I knew were bold. The timing was not great. We left here December 26th. The day of the cel- of the anniversary was January 6th. We needed to see Vietnam and set the whole context for Gail and her family and our guests. So th- that in the moment we arrived at the site to honor the 50 years since Dan and Walter gave their lives in service to prepare them for this experience, that was a bold step. I would say. And I felt, I felt it. I felt like, wow, I am the skipper of a spacecraft that's navigating uncharted territory. And I trusted spirit. I trusted others around me. I think this is a big part of boldness is, I've actually never thought about this question before is establishing trust within and trust surrounding. That's beautiful. Two quick things. I had actually posted something on my Facebook page and asked if people had questions for you. Yes. And there were just, a, there were a couple that oh, came great. through. Oh, great. I there love were, that. There were some that I know we covered already, so I won't be specific about it. But one woman, she said just kind of jokingly, she wanted to know about whether you have any vegan like she said she wants her vegan cinnamon rolls. 
do you ever play around with either vegan, so no butter, no eggs, and then I thought, well, gluten free too. Do you deviate or sometimes it depends? I've had clients that I've done gluten free work for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you just tweak your own recipes, or do you you try to go with something else that's more really true? the whole biochemical reactions are so different with gluten free products. One of my close, close friends launched a gluten-free cookie company and her cookies are phenomenal. They're called Ancient Grains. Mm. They're really good. Mm -hmm. It sounds familiar. So she and I were talking about this just this week about, well, I had baked cinnamon rolls. She was here and I said, I'm sorry to be baking these while you're here, but I have some and I'd love to share some with you and your family. And she said, I'll take them to my family. They will be so happy. And I said, Cynthia, shall we work together and create a gluten-free cinnamon roll? And she said, I'm just not so sure we can. Because it would take away from it. No, it would be so difficult. I mean, to get that quality. mm -hmm. But we can, I said, well, what if we think about it? I did a dinner roll for a client that was really good. So yes, I don't know. Yeah. It's like saying, we're going to take a spaceship to Saturn this year. (laughs) Let's see how far we get. Yeah, got it. Another Question. I used to work in a bakery. That was my first job when I was 16. I worked at the Mawa Bakery in New Jersey. And Where in New Jersey did you live? So Mawa is the name of the town, little town in Bergen County, North Jersey on the New York State border. And the wow. and, and sadly, the, the bakery's not there any longer. But, you know, I'd have to go into work at 430 in the morning and Klaus and Regina, the German owners, they would be in there with their big mixers, you know, yeah. making up the the dough. Um so this, the question, I, because of that experience, I know, I know how it is. And that, that previous question, by the way, was from a gal named Susan, but um, Marianne wanted to know, how do you not eat all the product <laughs> that you make? Mm. When you were in the test kitchen for the Cinnabons, mm-hmm. like you had to try those yourself, right? Oh, sure. But I tried them at the end of the day with everybody. Would you do like they do with wine? Would you spit it out or would you, would you just take a couple of bites and eat it? No, I ate them. That's such a great question that never occurred to me to be an issue. (laughs) I don't eat. I mean, I love cinnamon rolls, but I don't eat mountains of them. Mm -hmm. I love these breads. I mean, I kind of live on these whole grain breads and I will give you a slice to take home with you because they're made with flour, water. Ancient flour. Ancient grain flour. And salt. Mm -hmm. That's it. Flour, water, and salt. And they're all naturally fermented. Mm Mm-hmm. So there's no there's no yeast and there's no butter and yeah. sugar and all that. Yeah, they're okay. really delicious. I kind of live on those grains, so I eat as many as it. You know, I I put almond butter on them. I in my life have experienced eating disorder behavior when I was younger, and so it just isn't a category that enters my mind anymore. I'm just so happy about working with that, and I had a fantastic woman who supported me in creating a new way. And I did. A new way of eating. Mm -hmm. How young were you? One moment, please let me think. (laughs) I was in my early 40s. Oh, so not when you were 16. No, Mm -hmm. I was in my early 40s. So much later. Mm -hmm. It had been an issue for me when I was young. So when I was younger, and I think it was totally anxiety fueled, you know, just by being in a really dynamic, fast-moving bakeries are... Sure. So that's when you had Brousseau's. Mm-hmm. But in the early years. And then it was not an issue ever again. So I think I think what's really important about this question is knowing where our apostat is. I call it... That was my made-up word. Is because our apostat tells us if we're hungry or if we're full. And Apa I did, as an appetite. Yeah. I called it my apostat. That measured if there was if I was hungry or full. I just didn't have one before, and now I do. So, I eat when I'm hungry, and I stop when I'm full. I don't think most Americans know that feeling of whether they're hungry. It's just eating as a habit. Wow! Don't you think that? I don't know. I think that's why we have such an obesity problem. I just don't think people are dialed in. I mean, I know for myself that, uh, and I don't have a weight problem. Um, But I know for myself, I have become more mindful about my eating. And I will, before I pick something up, I 
give some thought. Am I actually hungry or am I bored? Do I want to just walk away from my laptop and go downstairs and grab a bite to eat because I need a break? Or am I really- Oh, that's so great. Or am I really hungry? Mm -hmm. And so I ask myself that. But I think that that's unusual because I think, because I've been unaware for 50 years, you know, and it's only been more Mm -hmm. recently Mm -hmm. that I've just become more aware and tried to train myself in that. So I think you, uh, I think you're unique in being aware of that because I think culturally we are just trained to eat, eat all the time, not when we're hungry, but just to snack and to have food Mm -hmm. there. That's why I always lose weight when I go travel because I'm so busy that I'm not snacking in between. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. So I think that I, I, I think that's a wonderful way for you to think of it and to share that with, you know, listeners, you know, I think that's a great thing for sure. Just to just give pause, think, you know, think Mm -hmm. whether it's you're hungry or, or not or bored. And that's why. So one last question, where can people find you? Are are you, um, are you active on social media or is it really people should find you through peace trees, peace trees dot Vietnam dot org? Yes. PeaceTreesVietnam.org. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I'll link to all this in the show notes yes. as well. Yes. That's the main place. Yes. Okay. And go it to is. your local mall or airport and enjoy a Cinnabon. They can. And they can look up PeaceTreesVietnam.org. Yes. Look up the stories. Yes. In there. Exactly. Wonderful stories. Mm-hmm. You're not tweeting. <laughs> I don't. Good. I don't. <laughs> That's good. Thank you so much for having me out here. And I can't tell you, I don't know why 20 years plus years went by. Isn't because that amazing? Our, because our lives are so, so similar. And hearing how much you love Vietnam. Oh, I didn't yeah, have yeah, any yeah, idea yeah. that you've been there so many times and how yeah. you feel about Vietnam. I don't think I've ever talked to anyone who said Vietnam is their second home. It's, so I, that's I, quite something. It's always weird for me mm-hmm. to say it, you know, because like I said, back then I was the tall one. And the blonde one, and I stuck out like a sore thumb. I brought John there in 2004, maybe. And um, that was the first international trip we had taken together. And he said, it's funny, before you brought up the planets, I thought, I'm going to bring him to Vietnam where I feel like home. And we got there and he was like, I feel like I'm on another planet. This is so bizarre for me. But I could walk down the street and the cyclo drivers would say, say hello, hello, Elizabeth. (laughs) Yeah. Which freaked him out <laughs> because they had remembered me because I had been there so many times and spent so yes. much time in Saigon. So yes, so to get back to your point, yes, we are kindred spirits. That's amazing. That. I love that. I know. So that's, we'll see each other more. We let's will. Make, we will. We make will. A plan. And yes, you can come back anytime. I will when you need an intern or you get with your ancient grains. Yeah, friend would you like to do and that do, sometime? I'll come over and do test kitchen stuff. Yeah, I've always said I would love to go and just. Go to France and spend three months working in a bakery just to learn the process. I think it would be fascinating. Yeah. But we can talk after this. We'll talk more because I see you have Dutch ovens and I just got a Dutch oven. We'll yeah, that's what I do my bread in. I just started doing that. I just did. You my, did? Yeah. Like six months ago, I just got a Dutch oven. It's purple, my favorite color. And I just started doing some breads in it. So how did it turn out? Unbelievable. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Geraldine. You're welcome. Thank you, Beth. (laughs) I'll see you again soon. Isn't she amazing? I really meant it when I said I want to work with her on a future trip to Vietnam. Now, I've offered a number of wander tours to Vietnam, but putting something together that includes a trip to Quang Tri province, to the Peace Tree Center there, and also to the Women's Union and the work they're doing to bring black pepper to Costco. Can you imagine that? Wouldn't that be so cool? Now, it may be a ways down the road, but if you're interested, drop me a note if you'd like to join such a tour. Beth at She's Bold Podcast. Dot com, and that's probably the best place to, to reach me. For links to all the things we chatted about in this episode, go to she's boldpodcast.com, and there you will find the show notes for this and all episodes. Also, I'll have to say, as I record this, I have a loaf of Dutch oven bread cooking. So if it turns out okay, I'll post photos in the show notes for this episode. While you're there on the website, don't forget to check out my Patreon page at she's boldpodcast.com slash Patreon. 
You can connect with me by friending me on Facebook, and I'm WanderGal on Instagram. You can find out more about me by visiting wanderlustandlipstick.com. Sign up for my newsletter on the Wanderlust and Lipstick site, and you'll receive a series of tips for making your travels safer. I've got giveaways coming up soon where you'll have the chance to win some goodies all to yourself. Last year, that included clothes from Prana and gear from Black Rapid Camera and Eagle Creek. And you'll be able to find out about those giveaways in the monthly newsletters. And you'll actually have to be a subscriber to win. Check out wandertours.com. That's W-A-N-D-E-R, wandertours.com if you'd like to travel with me. And although we do have a waiting list, we just had a couple of cancellations on our Fall Ireland tour. It's a women-only trip. So let me know if you're interested in that tour. Don't forget to leave a message at 877-280-5170 so I can feature you and any questions that you might have on a future episode. Ladies, don't forget to join the Be Bold Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Be Bold group. You're going to love the positivity, the encouragement, and the support from that community, which is over 2,000 strong. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Be Bold podcast. And until next time, be bold.